Good to be here. Always good to be here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Maat's Art Chat. This is a series of weekly podcast conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world. I'm Matt Micucci, and joining me today, John Marks, who is an acclaimed architect, but he's also a poet, and he's also a painter, as well as, as I like to say, an all-around creative soul. But specifically, though, he is the co-founding design principal and chief artistic officer at Form 4 Architecture, and among other things, he has recently published a major work, a book titled Etude, uh, The Poetry of Dreams Plus Other Fragments, which features 84 of his watercolor paintings, as well as 40 short poems. So we talk about that, but like I said, we also get into a conversation about architecture. We also talk about philosophy. We talk about dreams, curves, movement, the arts at large. Oh, and I did make sure to ask him, given that he does so much and he's got so many projects going on, he's just so active. I did ask him how he's able to achieve balance because that's something that I'm struggling with. And um, and maybe that's why I'm reading Kierkegaard at the moment. <laughs> Could be. But uh, I did ask him that, among other things, and it was a fascinating conversation. And I certainly hope that you will enjoy listening to it. So without further ado... Let's begin. Hi, John. Hi, Matt. I have been looking at some of your works and some of your artistic and philosophical uh, ideas and concepts, and it's amazing. It's so varied. So, given your work within architecture, but also, you know, we'll be talking about watercolor painting, poetry as well, and so on. I wanted to start off by asking you a little icebreaker question. When did sure. you first discover a love of the arts, and which art form did you start first start experimenting with, perhaps as a child? Uh, so. When I was seven, I knew I wanted to be an architect, but I originally wanted to be a painter. And I didn't really understand what architecture was until I went to architecture school. And that would have been when I was 18. So between seven and 18, those um, 11 years, I primarily painted, sketched, did photography. And, and I think that that painterly sense, that visual sort of emotional sense of art, really carries into the architecture because I, I like to say I do architecture backwards from what most architects do. And I also, um, tend to favor emotional meaning over, um, intellectual concept in the architecture. So I think that that formative time, uh, back in the Midwest, um, really sort of is what differentiates the, the architectural expression. And was there any particular reason why you basically knew from an early age that you wanted to be an architect? I wanted to be a painter. And back in the Midwest, it, it's a very pragmatic part of the world. And, and uh, being an artist is not considered a proper profession. And so when I was young in school, they had a little like, what do you want to be when you grow up? So I was looking through that. An artist was not on that list. It was a little booklet or something like that. And people were talk, walking through and talking about the different things. And when they got to architect, they said, architects are highly creative, expressive. You know, they're artists in the built form. And I said, oh, that could work for me. And then the next one was engineer. And I read that one. I said, that would not work for me. So from that moment, it was that sort of early epiphany that architect was the thing that I should do. And uh, I think... The world would have been different if I would have grown up somewhere else other than the Midwest. From that standpoint, I might have become a straight up practicing art artist in in a in a full time sense rather than in a broader sense. But but uh, you know, I don't I don't paint every day. I don't write a poem every day. That kind of a thing. You know, I read uh, the term lyrical expressionism linked to your work in architecture. Yes, yes. Yeah. How would you describe that? So um, it the the easiest way to start talking about the architecture is a conversation I had about 15 years ago with a group of friends. 
And, you know, people have some interesting views about Silicon Valley. But one of the things about Silicon Valley is there's really no significant architecture there. There's no there there. There's no place there. And friends of mine were asking, why are the buildings in Silicon Valley so ugly? And I think I had a really smart ass answer at the beginning. But later I thought about it. And I think the next day um, I was talking to them again. And I said, well, the thing about about architecture that you may not realize is the architects have not been allowed to design beautiful buildings in the last 50 years. And they said, isn't that absurd? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? And I said, you would think so, but we're not allowed. And it's an interesting concept because most people, when they think about it, they said, you know what, you're right. There aren't that many buildings that I, that I enjoy or, or I connect to emotionally that are modern. You know, I, I sort of, not, not that they're historic, or historicist um, oriented people, you know, they like modern culture, they like modern life, but the architecture hasn't gone there with them. And turns out, I believe there were two things that happened in architecture kind of at the dawn of postmodernism. And one of them was Robert Venturi wrote an excellent book called Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. And in that, he started to talk about richness and expression and how things don't have to align and things can be quirky. The problem was, though, he said you needed to do this intellectually and not emotionally. So he cut out the part of it that could really resonate with people. And he was a very intellectual designer. And at the same time in 1966, the Temptations um, made a song famous called Beauty is Only Skin Deep. And this concept of beauty is only skin deep changed the world in positive ways for so many people in the late 60s um, in terms of body image, in terms of what's really important. You know, it's like inner beauty versus outer beauty. But the problem was the architecture profession and to some degree the fine arts institutions reinterpreted that to mean that anything that was beautiful was superficial. So architects have been practicing this sort of minimalist modernism and they oftentimes actually take the beauty or the prettiness out of their architecture in order to be taken seriously. So lyrical expressionism is a concept for me to to sort of rebel against the notion that architecture should be emotionally meaningless. And so the idea of expressionism is, is forms that are exciting, that they're dynamic, that they engage you, and that um, lyrical means that there's a narrative that goes with it. And the narrative sometimes can be anthropomorphic. The building can kind of look a little bit like something, but oftentimes it's, it's a natural form that, that just has this story that goes with the program and the purpose of the building. That does make me think about another thing that I read about your work in, in terms of architecture, performance-driven. What does that mean? Oh, so, so in, it's interesting in architecture, you get, a, you, you get a wide spectrum. It's like any sort of, of art form or um, where you've got people that are on the lyrical side of things and like Zaha Hadid, I don't know if you know her work that well, um, very fluid and curvaceous. Um, she did the 20th century museum in um, in Rome. She's done another, a, a whole bunch of very dynamic buildings uh, around the world. But um, she oftentimes is not that pragmatically driven. So the thing for me that's intriguing in architecture is that we have program, we have the building has to function in a certain way. And, and these can be very pragmatic concerns. But at the same time, it emotionally has to function. So performance driven means that it's highly sustainable, that it meets the program, that people can actually use the building. And at the same time, you can make something that, you know, raises people's psyche, that touches their heart in some way. And that's something that people oftentimes, architects oftentimes take one side or the other, and they don't try to do both. Yeah, when I read that statement, for some reason, I also thought about... um performance in terms of you know performance art <laughs> oh interesting yes no it's more it's more about pragmatics but um but the building does need to perform it's on a stage a very public stage all of the time so emotionally i think buildings should give you something as you're interacting with them and i think oftentimes architects 
fail to believe that's important. Yeah, because、uh, I also feel like most people wouldn't think about narrative in building, you know. And this again, I think, has a lot to do with the way in which people just have a restricted sort of viewpoint or tend to. It's not their fault, but it's just maybe it's impulsive for them or instinctive to think of art in more restrictive terms、uh, in that sense. <sighs> Yeah, well, and and so you know, sometimes the narrative. I mean, it could have a ver- wide variety of narratives. Every design doesn't have to have a narrative, but I think they're especially powerful for people when there is one. And so there is a project called Sanguine Lily, and I don't know if you had seen that one. It is rather anthropomorphic in the sense that it's that it's a very light, delicate concrete shell in the shape of a lily flower, but it's about the 1916 uprising in Dublin, and it was supposed to be. It was a design competition for a chapel in the Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin to commemorate the 232、um, Irish folks that were buried in a mass grave as part of the rebellion in, in in Dublin. So, of course, you know, for an architect, lyrical expressionism. This is, you know, it's just like a trifecta of wonderful things you can work with, but. The story of the lily flower, which is still in graffiti in Ireland as the symbol of rebellion, and also the idea of a baptismal font, and also the number two hundred and thirty-two, those form the narrative for that project. And so, it makes the project especially powerful because if you know what those narrative pieces are and you see them in the architecture, then the architecture means a lot more to you than it would by just saying, "Well, that's pretty." So. The the lyrical part, the narrative part, gives certain buildings anyway a greater emotional depth for people who experience them. Right, I do know that building. I grew up in Ireland, so. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So,、um, I mean, it was it was、uh, one of those things that that emotionally it was trying to be uplifting. It was trying to be transparent. It it was one of the more. F- Fun projects I've ever designed, I think, is to try to deal with the issues of history and try to formulate them into some kind of a building that was highly expressive and didn't and and, and had a lot of symbolism in it. Do you so you do think about time and you you express kind of thoughts about time and perhaps memory too?、Uh, well, more in the paintings and in the poetry than in the architecture,、um, but in in. The sanguine lily, for example, there is this sense of of movement, not not as much in the building design, which does have movement, but in the idea that the flower comes off of a stone sort of base、um, in the back, it's sort of like a big form, and that form represents history, and and there's a heaviness to it because history is can be a very heavy weight. You know, on our souls, and it's 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 something that you you can never let go of, but it doesn't have to hold you down. And then the idea was that the the chapel itself was highly transparent on the sides, and and looking out towards both the past, which was the cemetery, and the future, which was the gardens on the other side, and the city around the cemetery, that would be the future. And so.、Um, That idea of the past transitioning into what could be the future was part of that that narrative、um, in that particular building. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, and the concept of time and movement have forever been linked. <laughs> so yes, yes, yes.、Texts. So in February, you published a new book titled "Etude:、uh, The Poetry of Dreams Plus Other Fragments," and it's a beautiful、yes. book. And、um, well, and I、you. wanted to talk about that. Um, but first, I just it just occurred to me now as I was considering the the title, the the word etude, which is usually you know used to refer to short musical pieces. <laughs> yes.、And、can you?、Uh, how would you? Well, yes.、That? So this goes back to painting. So、hmm. interestingly enough, you know, so growing up in the Midwest in in the in the sixties, you you didn't have access to a lot of culture directly, and so. Probably in the middle of junior high school, I I subscribe to the Time Life series of art, and I think this was a set of books. I think I still have them.、Um, I think there were about thirty or forty books, and they were these long, thin volumes with lots of pictures, and they usually described an art era or an artist. 
and one of them was James Abbott McNeil Whistler. And there was a lyricism to his paintings and also to the titles of the paintings. And he oftentimes used musical references. And I was fascinated by this idea of musical references, the idea that it sort of transported you into looking at things in a different way. You know, so he would have, you know, abstraction number six in, in gray and silver, or almost like using the word prelude to talk about a painting. And the idea of etudes, which is studies in French, relative to music, I thought was appropriate to the idea that these, all of these paintings, in a sense, were studies. They were all sort of preparing for something in a romantic notion, something in the future that hadn't formed itself yet. And, and also, I suppose it was a little self-depreciating that it meant that I'm still working on it. I'm still wandering. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Versus a building, which is not a study. It's actually quite concrete. So this permits me a little bit of, of, of indulgence that I don't have to take myself too seriously. Right, right, right. And, you know, like I, like I said, the book is, looks beautiful. And I'm also, by that, I also mean that the book itself is designed beautifully. And I was wondering whether that was. The thing that's really precious about it, which, which is, is, is hard to, um, overestimate the impact of it, is the whole book is printed on watercolor paper. Oh. And, uh, it's interesting because we had to do, it took, three full months to do the color proofing because offset printing companies are not set up to print on highly absorbent paper. So um, we had to do three full wet proofs on the actual printer they were going to print it on in China. Um, you know, normally you do co color proofing on a proofing press and then the press itself is so close to the proofing press that you're in good shape. But, um, in this case, we had to wait for the press to be available to do our little tiny print run of proofing copies. And we also used a very special red ink called rhodamine in order to get the blacks in the, in the improvisation section to be as crisp and dark as they were. Cause the paper just sucks everything up into it. And, um, um, it, it was quite a process to get it to work. Yeah, because I was going to bring up the design, but it's the materials too. I mean, in addition, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then the design. So the design is a very deep collaboration with this incredible uh, graphic artist named Jeremy Mendy, who works out of San Francisco. He's a professor at the uh, California College of Arts. And we've been working for many, many years. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at some of the visual poems that were part of, I think we sent yeah, you I did, way yeah. too many things, but. Um, so he and I collaborated on the visual poems. And so what it would, would be is that with the visual poems, we sit down and I talk about this philosophical thing that I wanted to express in visual form. And then he would kind of think about it and he'd come back with options. And then we would start. And sometimes these things would take 10, 20 hours each in order for us to kind of balance what it needed to be and what's the right image and what's the right tonality. And he had a really beautiful, sketchy kind of quality that we kept throughout all of them. But it was an adventure in collaboration to figure out like how to get these to express a very intellectual notion in a visual form. And our little joke was um, the first visual poem set that went public was used in the Venice Biennale in a collateral event that I was part of in 2016. And you go to the, the, the art museums in Venice, and this is before, you know, this is in a goth, in, oftentimes in a Gothic time when paintings told stories because people couldn't read and write. And so we were joking around that people now are so glued to their phones that they don't read anymore as well. So they need visual cues to tell them the story about what life means and what culture means and what philosophy means. So we've kind of come full circle. So we were joking around about how that's, that was the relevance of the visual poems is this allows people to, to read a narrative without the burden of words. Yeah. And, you know, I was fascinated with it because again, maybe some of the listeners, you know, who hear the word poetry, 
uh, will be more inclined to think of the traditional sort of poet format, the structure. It's yeah. just words on paper. But this, we're talking about something different. In fact, when I was looking at it, it was, um, you know, from a Western standpoint, obviously, uh, it was kind of uh, making me think of all the, the artists, like, for example, the futurists at the start of the 20th century who worked a lot with playing with words in an artistic oh, yeah, way. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then of the, I'm I'm pretty sure the German expressionist did the same thing. It was something yes. that was that they, that they experimented with a lot at the turn of the 20th century or in the early years. Yeah. So Jeremy and I were both are both fascinated by that those eras in graphic design, and um, I actually used to teach a graphic design slash digital architecture course at UC Berkeley for five years. But I really wanted to work with Jeremy on the book, and so. We started a process. Originally, we were only going to do eight of the poems, of the 42 poems. We were only going to do eight of them in a kind of a graphic format. But we got so inspired, we did all 42. And it was interesting because sometimes Jeremy would want the format of the poem to relate to the watercolor. And so each of those poems, I'd say... Together, we spent three to four hours on each one, and it would start with me reading the poem to him. And also, the poem has a certain inherent format to it that he needed to respect, like how it broke down into subsections. But then where it went from there, you know, it was kind of open-ended. So sometimes, though, he would create a graphic scenario where it was too disruptive to read. And I said, Jeremy, the thing about poetry is imagine you're skipping down a road and you're, you're humming a song and, and you're really getting into the cadence of what you're doing. And suddenly there's a sign in the road and you have to stop skipping and stop singing and read the sign to know where to go next. If that happens, you've ruined the poem. So there was an incredible amount of back and forth and massaging and what's the right narrative, what's the right thing to pick off of. And so sometimes... The, the graphic design relates to the poem itself, and sometimes it relates to the watercolor, and sometimes it relates in an unusual way. But I think um, it came out quite delightfully. We haven't talked about dreams uh, yet. And, ah. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things about the watercolors, and to some degree the poetry, is none of the watercolors exist, none, none of the things depicted actually exist in physical space. So they're all memories of something rather than the thing directly itself. So as an architect, you know, we design a new reality. So all of the, all of the watercolors have been designed. So even if they're somewhat referential to a physical space, it's not going out there and sketching. It's, it's sketching the memory of that place. And so if you go to that place, you go, oh, well, he got this wrong and he got that wrong. But I'm trying to, to grasp the spirit of what I remember and what was emotionally meaningful to me about it. And so I know that's not unique, but that's an underlying aspect of all of the um, watercolors. On the so topic of watercolor, I did want to ask you specifically whether there was any reason in particular why you appreciate the distinctive potential of watercolors and perhaps they allow you to do things that other uh, types of paint or would allow you to do? You know, I think that the, the thing is, uh, as a medium, it's, it's an easy medium for someone that's not doing it in a studio full time. There's also a long tradition in architecture of doing watercolors in the Beaux-Arts era. And a lot of the drawings that, that architects used to do used to be very much watercolor based. And so I think to a large degree, it came out of that culture. And when I, there, there aren't any in here, but in college, I was quite good by that time at painting architecture. So I've got a whole slew of, of architectural, very, you know, specific to, um, building designs. And before I started designing on the computer, I would always, almost always do a watercolor of each project that I designed. And then when the computer allowed you to do this in 3D and allowed you to do something different, I sort of abandoned the architectural painting and just focused on the fine arts painting. Zaha Hadid actually is one of the other few architects who, who paint a lot. Um, and she started out with these huge canvases, maybe 
15 feet tall, some of them. And she would work out her design ideas um, in acrylic and oil paint. But I think she had the um, advantage of having a full-time studio where she could do that, where I, you know, I have a corner of a room. So, so watercolors, you know, facilitated the ability to be expressive, but without having to have a lot of physical space. You brought up computers. And of course, I would say that, <laughs> you know, even in your line of work, you have to sort of be in touch with all the technological advancements and so on. But I mean, how would you... Uh, describe your relationship to the new technologies when it comes to fine arts? So, so it's interesting because, well, two things. One is this idea of embracing paradox. And to me, paradox is how to be visceral and yet virtual at the same time. So, and to embrace both of those things and kind of seek the quality. So back in 1991, when Software was just coming out that allowed you to design on the computer. Interestingly enough, I had, I had bought a computer and I had bought some software and I was just playing around with it when I got laid off at the job I was at. So I ended up having 10 months with nothing to do except convert my portfolio from watercolors and drawings into 3D models. And I taught myself how to do 3D modeling and how to do graphic design in the computer in Photoshop. So I was absolutely an early adopter of digital design and actually an advocate that architects needed to do more design in, in three dimensions on a computer. And one of the things about that is that we design physical objects and we're using very crude two-dimensional tools to design those three-dimensional objects. It's actually quite a bit more powerful to design a three-dimensional object using a three-dimensional tool, even though it's a virtual tool, but to use it. And I discovered that once I got over the idea that I didn't have to sketch everything, it's so much more consistent with what we do to design in 3D in a modeling program. So, but, but I spent maybe, you know, five or six years trying to do it exclusively in the modeling program, which of course is naive because you need to, in reality, do sketching and things in 3D. So you need a digital side and you need a kind of a physical side to it because your ideas don't flow fast enough um, if you only do the sketch, if you only do the, the digital design part. So what happened was when I first started teaching my digital design course at UC Berkeley, I, I made the students only do work in 3D on the computer, and they were not allowed to do any sketching. And part of this was to get them over the learning curve. And now, interestingly enough, now that all the kids coming out of school know how to design in 3D, they, none of them want to sketch. So now my, my design assistants, my, my crew in the office, I make them sketch all the time because they try to make the perf one perfect object in 3D and it takes too long. And they really need to go through 20, 30 different ideas and think in a more expansive way. And sketching is the only way to really do that. So I have to try to push them, pull them, trick them into sketching more often, which is not as easy as it seems. <laughs> they don't want to draw. The young architects don't want to draw. They see it as old school. Why am I doing this? Uh, well, what, what, that, that, that can't be a good thing. <laughs> well, I don't think so at all. Because like I said, you know, they tend to, they tend to try to, to pick one idea at the beginning and obsessively work on it in 3D. And, and I say, you know, you're going to work up one idea. You're going to spend 10 hours on it. And I'm going to dismiss it in 10 seconds. I'd rather have you do 30 or 40 sketches and then let's figure out which ones are good and let's figure out which ones you're going to explore. But they just, you know, they just try so hard to get it into 3D right away. But sometimes the fundamental idea is just not that good. And they haven't, you know, you really do need in architecture, you have to explore a number of different things. And that's actually part of the joy of designing is to come up with 20 different ideas. And, you know, 18 of them are going to be pretty bad, but it's the two that are brilliant. That's the only way you can get that. Yeah, this prompts me to ask you a question, actually. Uh, and this may be a silly question, but feel free to answer it in whatever <laughs> way you'd like. But uh, I'm, I often think about this in terms of just artists and how aware are you of your own artistic ev evolution? And do you find that your own artistic evolution is somehow guided by things outside of yourself? You know, just for example, 
technological advancements, or are you more interested in just being true to your own nature of being, <laughs> for want of a better term? Well, against, again, it's to me, it's a paradoxical balance equation. So I think the way I look at it, I'm on a journey wandering through life. And, and uh, I had a previous mono architectural monograph called Wandering the Garden of Technology and Passion. And I see it a bit as wandering. And I think some architects want to be on a very linear course. And that works for somebody like Richard Meyer, let's say, um, where he's got a specific style. He works in that style. He's refining that style. And ironically, he's not the best designer in the style that he established oftentimes. Um, a lot of times, some of the buildings that people love of his were designed by other people in the office working in his style under his guidance. But I've always been intrigued by the idea that the world is a feast and there's a lot of things to love. The downside is if you're too broad, you never focus and you never refine. So the trick is to be open and yet be on a path, but yet let the path wander, <laughs> if that makes sense. I, absolutely, yeah. So that's kind of the, the view I take on it. I, I want to be open and, and have the opportunity for change and growth to occur. But at the same time, there are fundamental things. You know, when you look at the watercolors, there's a consistency to them, even though they were done over a wide span of time. An underlying consistency, even though, you know, they might be different subject matters. Um, the same is true of the poetry. The, the architecture changes a bit more than that, but there's still an underlying, because the problem with, with architecture is it's all done by commission. So, Sometimes the, the client wants a very boxy, efficient, inexpensive building, and you have to try to give it humanity and life. So I'm a great lover of designing with curves, um, but sometimes your, your building project can't afford it. Like there's no curves in my house. <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my, you know, for my final question was, what do you think of labels in the sense that, for example, uh, when I look at what you do, uh, you're an architect, but you're also, you know, writing poetry or, uh, you know, painting and stuff like yeah. that. So that makes me think of you more in terms of a, I don't, a multidisciplinary artist. I don't know whether you would agree with that. Yes. No, no, I would, I would agree with that. And I think the thing is, within architecture, in the old days, this would have been... Um, you know, 50 years ago and before, I think our architects saw themselves as artists and they actually functioned as artists. They used to write more poetry. They used to, you know, do more painting, sculpture and different things like that. And they saw themselves as a part of a spectrum of the arts. And I think after World War II, this shifted and architects became almost more like facilitators and engineers. And, and I think, um, Labels are helpful in trying to get people to understand what you're doing and what you're about. But as a label can aid you in people saying, oh, well, this person is a such and such. That's what they do. It can also hinder you that, you know, you become blocked into this thing and, you, you know, you sort of can't change. The reality is, is, um, you know, sometimes you have to break out of that. But I know, um, there are musicians that get labeled as, as doing the old work was the great work. And why are they doing this new work? And we've got a good friend, um, Mark Kozalik, who's an, an independent musician and everybody loves his old work. And he's frustrated in a sense that, you know, why don't they love the new work? Cause he's moved on. And, um, I think, you know, you, one, you have to decide what your art is about and, um, whether you want to embrace going back to what resonated with people because maybe your underlying message was more important than your personal stylistic desire to change or is what you're doing important and people just need to catch up. And, you know, each artist has to wrestle with that dynamic. And, um, and it's true in architecture as well as painting as well as poetry. So your, your underlying motivation is, is tricky. Um, and for me, for the watercolors and for the poetry, they are definitely responsive to the times, the moment where I'm writing or painting. But fortunately for me, they're, they're free of commercial needs. So I don't need to try to make a living painting or, 
writing poetry, which frees me up to do follow more, wander down that path more. Architecture is a little different story. You know, there you get into the issues of branding and business and how are you perceived in the marketplace and, you know, how much clarity do people want on, oh, Form 4, John Marks, this is what they do. This is what you would expect to get. And of course, it's the same dynamic is if you define yourself too rigidly, then people will only hire you for that. And, oh, interesting. Uh, but earlier you were you mentioned that you know you believe that great architecture is part intellectual and part emotional. Yes. Uh, so there is a, there is a you know that would lead one to believe that you know you need to find that balance. But you know as I think about all the things that you do, would you consider yourself a balanced person? <laughs> Personal balance is very 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 important. I think that we tend to see the world in binary ways. I mean, gender is a perfect example. You know, we see, tend to see ourselves as, as male or female. Where in reality, I believe that we're all on a spectrum between those things and we embrace the qualities of both. There's a great set of words called animus and anima, I think. And each one is, one is the male part of the female spirit and the other one is the female part of the male spirit. And I think we all have these elements within us. Some of us are further on one side of the bell curve than the others um, because it's a spectrum of people. But the reality is it's a very broad um, world that we live in. I think we all have to, to address that balance equation personally, you know, and things that we do. But I don't think people see it that way so much as, you know, like, well, I have to go out and make money and therefore, so they go on a linear path and they don't realize that they need to make money and they also need to pay taxes because taxes contribute to the social good. And they don't see that as a balanced equation. They see that as the government's taking my money. Yeah. I mean, my father, who was an economist, he was an economics professor, said that, you know, the test of a true liberal is if they happily pay their taxes. Now, they might disagree with how efficiently and how well it's being spent, but they happily pay it because they see in balance the social good of paying taxes. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do see you. everything, almost everything in life as a balance equation. Everything. Yeah, I, th I think we, we kind of have been seeing that in these days with the pandemic and people just still... Uh... There were some videos going around of people still uh, refusing to wear the mask in supermarkets. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, I was talking to a woman, actually, who, who's in London, who's coming to the United States for, for work. She has already had COVID, so she has the antibodies, and she actually has a high level of the antibodies. And she was wondering if she should quarantine when she gets here. And we were all telling her, no, no, you shouldn't quarantine. And But we, we asked her how she felt about wearing a mask. And she said, you know, I think even though I can't give it, get it, and because I've already had it, and I can't give it to anyone else, she's going to wear a mask anyway in solidarity. You know, because it's more important to get people to be comfortable wearing masks, even though technically she's one of those people that doesn't need to wear one at all. But we... We, we need to look at the bigger picture of how everything fits within the world. And I think the pandemic is actually an extraordinary opportunity to revisit so many things, to experiment with so many things we couldn't do normally. And in some ways, the Black Lives Matters movement that's, that's, that represents a huge opportunity for positive change comes out of this environment of questioning what's important that the pandemic really started in a serious way because we're all trying to deal with this balance equation in the entire world all at the same time and it's very rare that we're all on the same page about having the same problem in the entire world at the same time you know it crosses all socioeconomic religious political spectrums i mean people can ignore it obviously and say i'm not wearing a mask but but we're all we all have a common focus and so it does give us the opportunity to make, to experiment and make interesting changes and change our balance equation if we can see it that way. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. All right. Well, I, we okay. could talk about this forever, but, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. but it was an absolute pleasure to, to speak with you, John. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Matt, for the opportunity.